Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our Dean Speaker Series on Innovators, Change Makers, and Art Benders, where we're featuring some of the leading thinkers and change makers of our time whose work has helped transform public health. My name is Michael Liu, I'm the Dean of Berkeley Public Health. And for this conversation, I'm pleased to bring together a panel who truly exemplify the title of the series, Innovators, change makers, and art vendors in public health. All right, I, I know some of you are probably asking, what's an art vendor? I know you get innovators and change makers, and some of you may actually know about air vendors and water vendors, but what's an art vendor? Well, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. assured us that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. The problem is that the arc doesn't bend by itself, that somebody's got to bend. All four of our panelists today exemplify what I call arc benders. They spent their life bending the arc of moral universe toward justice. And all four of them have played a pivotal role in advancing an idea that has helped transform medicine and public health from how we prevent chronic diseases to how we design programs and policies to support early childhood development. The idea is the life course perspective. In a minute, I'm gonna ask our panelists to define what the life course perspective mean for them. But I just have to say that as a Dean at UC Berkeley, I'm just so proud of the pivotal role that Berkeley has played in giving rise to such a powerfully transformative idea. From the three pioneering longitudinal studies of the children, of children that's, that was launched in the 1920s at UC Berkeley by what is now called the Institute uh, of human development to the trailblazing work of Glenn Elder uh, uh, okay, while he was an assistant professor at Berkeley in the 1960s and Glenn is widely regarded as the father of the life course perspective to the work of Neil Halfon that brought about a paradigm shift in maternal child health to the groundbreaking work that current Berkeley faculty Ron Dahl and Julie Deardorff are doing to advance the life course theory and practice. We got a lot to talk about today, so I won't read their bios, but I'll just say that they are among the people that I admire the most in public health. I'm truly grateful for their friendships over the years. With us today in alphabetical order are uh, Dr. Ron Dahl, professor at UC Berkeley School of Public Health and the Joint Medical Program and the director of the Institute of Human Development at UC Berkeley. Julie Deardorff, also professor at UC Berkeley School of Public Health and head of our maternal, child, and adolescent health program. Glenn Elder, Odin Distinguished Research Professor of Sociology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And Neil Halfon, professor of pediatrics and public health at UCLA and the founding director of the UCLA Center for Healthier Children, Families, and Communities. Thanks everyone for so much for, for joining us today. All right, so, so I'm gonna start by asking each of our panelists to give a five minute opening remark. And, and for those in our audience who may be less familiar with the idea of the life course perspective, please include a definition of what the life course perspective is and provide an example from your own work to help our audience better understand what the life course perspective is. So, so let, let, let's perhaps start from where you all started. Uh, so, so let's go to Glenn first. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, <clears throat> when I arrived at the Berkeley Institute in the early 1960s, I discovered that many of the Oakland study members who were born in the 1920s, 21, had experienced hard times with their families in the Great Depression. However, such change was not uh, the focal point. No one at the Institute paid any attention to this, um, this income loss and the difficulty uh, families were having. Uh, and a, a similar picture applied to the Berkeley cohort of 1928-29. John Clausen was my faculty member uh, mentor, and John <clears throat> noted that I kept returning 
to the Oakland families and the losses they were going through and trying to understand what was happening there. He actually persuaded me to uh, use the time that I had uh, to, to get to know more about these Oakland families. And that's exactly what I did. This process of, of um, exploring the Oakland families who were going through the Great Depression, which was really not a recognized uh, issue in the Institute. No one really paid any attention to this except uh, some of the families, some of the people who were dealing with families out in the uh, community. This was then the beginning of children of the Great Depression. I kept working on this. Um, John had his own agenda and I worked uh, steadily to try to understand the families that were going through hard times. The um, older boys in the um, Berkeley or the Oakland study were clearly the most advantaged during the Great Depression, but um, comparisons with the younger Berkeley cohort of 1928-29 revealed that this younger group was really at risk uh, of hardship and, and um, uh, mental illness, all kinds of problems. The, over the years then, uh, as I worked from this body of information and data, core principles of the life course started to emerge. And they are uh, the notion of interdependence, linked lives, the choices people make as expressed as human agency, timing, the timing of events um, and roles, transitions, historical time and place. And of course that applied to the Oakland families going through the Great Depression um, and all of its hardships and the lifespan scope of human development and aging. The life course idea represents a contextual perspective on human development and aging. Lives are shaped by the world in which we live. And I turn it over now to my next colleague. <laughs> uh, and that's the end of this part. Great, thank, thank you so much, Glenn. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go Neil next. Yeah, thanks, Michael, and thanks, Glenn. Uh, it's great to be with you. Um, uh, for the symposium. Uh, I understand the life course perspective is understanding the factors and forces that influence an individual's path, their performance, and their potential to fulfill their life's goal. It connects the dots between experience and exposures early in life, including prenatally and even preconceptually, and what develops and unfolds over time. Um, it's interesting, and you know, just reflecting on what Glenn was talking about, my my light bulb that went on around life course for me happened when I was actually the assistant director of the joint medical program at UC Berkeley, and I was running something at, at Oakland Children's called the Center for the Vulnerable Child. We set up the first uh, comprehensive clinic for children in foster care. And as I was taking care of these children in foster care, there were different growth trajectories that we would see. And what, what was interesting was that you would see a child that was growing at their 90th percentile on an even trajectory, and then they were moved into foster care and all of a sudden they dropped down and things changed and the trajectory changed. Or exactly the opposite, a child was born and was growing at the third percentile and was removed from their home at age four or five and shot up to the 60th percentile and moved forward. And I said, like, why is this happening? Why is, why is it that 
this life experience and context, once we, in a sense, transplant the child out of one environment into the other, then the entire trajectory of that child's life changed. And, you know, was it genes? Was it germs? Was it chemical exposures? What was it in the context that was leading to that? Were they family habits or neighborhood exposures? And how do we understand that? And how do we understand that not only how it was changing their growth trajectories, their head circumference, but obviously something was going on that was getting under their skin and changing everything about how that child fun function because the growth trajectory is a, is a summative measure of metabolic and biological factors that were changing. So to me, that's when I began asking Len Syme and Tom Boyce and others, I said, there's something happening here. We're not really focusing on it. And I actually went and met with John Clausen at the time. He was still at Berkeley, mm -hmm. talked with him about it. And so that I got, I got bit by the life course bug and, and yeah. started to think about how do we understand these cumulative mechanisms about cumulative adversity or cumulative positive exper experiences. But how do we understand about these latent mechanisms or time specific things happening during a sensitive period of a child's development that somehow changes their life course trajectories and moving forward. So that led me to really rethink how we thought about health and how health develops. And, um, you know, I was trained like most other physicians in the biomedical model that w was reductionist, simple, linear, and uh, in its orientation. And everything was because of a gene, a germ, or a or a chemical or, uh, or everything else was just bad luck and started to realize uh, at that time uh, that there was this biopsychosocial world of context and exposures that we weren't paying attention to and weren't understanding how important development was and developmental processes were. And so um, my understanding of life course came from that experience, that clinical experience of taking care of children in foster care, understanding the trajectories were quite mutable and that it was contextually driven. Um, but it was really about understanding those forces and mechanisms that led to these different, very different pathways for uh, children as they grew. And that led me to think about, well, what happens if we have really good preschools? How does that transform things? Or what happens if we can really support parents in a very different way? And, and, um, and the whole world opened up. <laughs> Thanks, Neil. Uh, Julie? And thanks, Michael. Um, I just want to start by saying it's truly an honor to be included in this group of colleagues. Um, I've learned more than you know from all of you over the course of my training and studies, and your lifetime contributions to the field have definitely shaped how I approach my own research and research questions. Um, so I should start by saying that I am a child and uh, adolescent clinical psychologist. So Probably similar to Neil, I was trained in very individual models of care and, um, and learned a lot about individual trajectories of health in, in the course of my lifetime. So my graduate work was steeped in developmental theories, uh, which I think contribute a lot to the life course, um, about how health and mental health unfold over time. Um, this work was, of course, influenced by Glenn Elder and his colleagues. And in my training, there was a particular emphasis on early life events. So um, many people think about how early adversity affects young children, zero to five. Uh, what was challenging about that was um, a lot of the interpretation of that was very deterministic. And so I love, Neil, that you touched on how mutable uh, some of these factors are, not just in early life, but over the life course. Uh, and uh, it wasn't until I became very interested in puberty and adolescence that I started understanding and realizing that the teen years were another space, uh, a period in which, um, looks like you have a team behind you, Glenn, <laughs> was a, a, another time of life that had incredible impact, both in terms of 
how stress gets under the skin and also opportunity for, um, for, for trajectories to be changed. And I love the way Ron Dahl refers to this. He talks about this as an inflection point at which we have um, yet another opportunity to intervene and promote positive health behaviors and also to change context so that youth can thrive and um, shift trajectories to more positive ends. Uh, so I started in the early developmental period, um, got interested in puberty, and learned that pubertal timing was actually a biological marker that could shift depending on early life experiences. And to me, that was profound, not, not simply because of the timing of puberty, and in particular girls' puberty, but the fact that something biological could be a marker for many other health effects and outcomes and internal processes from early life experiences, even, and as an adolescent psychologist, I was moving earlier upstream, even to think about in utero effects and intergenerational effects, um, and then downstream long-term outcomes like cardiovascular risk that were associated with some of these transitions in puberty um, and cancer. Uh, so inevitably my work became contextualized by the life course, um, because now we were talking not just from cradle um, to grave, but also intergenerational effects. Mm -hmm. I think where, um, where the light bulb went off for me was just as I was graduating uh, from my doctoral program, um, Michael Liu and Neil Halfon published, published a paper that contextualized it all from a public health perspective. And here I was a psychologist who had never even thought about public health mm -hmm. and um, had never thought about how my developmental background mm -hmm. could be integrated in a way where we could start thinking about upstream factors like context and structural and social issues, as opposed to trying to manage these health and mental health outcomes um, in clinic one by one by one. Um, and we could actually learn a way from a psychosocial perspective to go to the well, so to speak, and um, see how to heal things from a larger contextual perspective. Thanks. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, Julie. Uh, Ron? So thank you again. It's, it's an honor to be part of this uh, really remarkable discussion. I, I would like to uh, really highlight a couple things that have already been said and, and add a little bit of how I got pulled so strongly into thinking this way. Um, I, I was trained as a pediatrician, but I had early uh, research interests in brain development and, and how brain development contributed to healthy development as well as problems. And, and to me, part of the uh, attraction of life course uh, perspective is that it allows us to think about individual development and individual experience longitudinally. It's why it, it, it requires longitudinal studies. Yeah. But, by doing this, multi, thinking about multi-level developmental processes and experience at the individual level, we can begin to understand and have insight into sensitive periods, sensitive times when particularly difficult or, or, or challenging experiences can have a bigger effect. It's, it's a pivotal time. It's, a, it's an inflection point that can go to a negative uh, trajectory to health problems and difficulties. But in many ways, those same sensitive windows also create opportunities for positive impact, having the right kinds of experiences. And, and this became really clear when thinking about trajectories related to just literally growth. And, and so we know that if you happen to be in a pubertal growth spurt at the time of a war or a famine or difficulty, it's gonna have a bigger impact because you're growing at twice the speed you would have been you know, a year or two earlier. And that's an individual experience. Uh, as Julie's work and others have shown, the, the timing of puberty is, is, is not just being an age, it's, it's a developmental process. And similarly, if you were trying to invest in a, in a population level where, that had nutritional challenges, it would be extra important to have proper nutrition and calcium and phosphorus and exercise to create bone density during this time of, of, of dynamic change. But for me, that's not only a great example it's also a metaphor for what's happening at the level of the brain. The brain has sensitive periods of learning when the kinds of experiences we have, particularly the social relationships and social learning and emotional learning has the same kind of sensitive window when negative experiences can have an outsized impact in a negative way. And that was studied, a lot of the work I was involved in earlier as, as vulnerabilities for behavioral and emotional and social problems. 
But increasingly, we're recognizing that the same multi-level dynamic changes create opportunities for positive experiences to help pivot in, in positive directions of development. And that has some of the most important implications for public health. Investing in times to create those positive social and emotional learning experiences, the positive social relationships, the kinds of school experiences and family support and economic support to match to these windows of time when they're gonna have a larger impact. And that now we can start being strategic in prioritizing certain kinds of, of, of positive learning experiences, positive social support in ways that are gonna pay dividends. They are investments that are gonna have a larger impact because they affect a trajectory during a window of time. And this incredible body set of bodies of research that, that give us insights into life course perspectives begin to identify these windows of opportunity for these kinds of interventions and ways to have greater impact in positive ways in the health, not only of individuals, but their families and communities. Thanks so much, Ron. And uh, let's uh, dive deeper into what you all just said. Uh, and maybe, uh, can, let me start with, with you, uh, Glenn. Uh, and first of all, let me just say that it's such a great honor uh, to be in this conversation with you because so many of us who work on health from a life course perspective have drawn inspiration from your work. Now, I felt like I didn't give you enough time in the opening remark to go deeper into some of the, the really, really important core uh, principles that you talked about, such as you know, time and place, timing, link life, lifespan yeah. development, and so yeah. forth. Uh, and so, so yeah, I, I want you to take a little more time explaining what these core principles are, and maybe draw examples. I know you looked at children that's gone through Great Depression, children that's gone through Cultural Revolution in China. Can, can you yeah. could draw some examples to help you illustrate more yeah. principles? Yeah. Well, one one very good example. Um, you may have may know that um, I followed the Oakland children uh, as well as the Berkeley cohort. The, these are two cohorts. Uh, one is 192021, and the other is 1928-29. Um, so they're nine years, eight years apart, and they're uh, moving across time, hitting these crises like the Great Depression. Uh, and um, I think that um, uh, one of the things that uh, we tend to do is even, even uh, probably some of the work I've done uh, does that. And that is um, put all, of, all the significance on one time period transition, uh, looking at the kids who are going through the Great Depression, young and old, older, and the young kids, the young boys, are very badly uh, impaired by the experience, and they do poorly in school, and they uh, end up later um, being recruited into uh, the military. And this is not World War II, but it's uh, it's Korea. And 76% of the Berkeley kids, boys, were mobilized into the military. And they come out uh, really, uh, in many ways, repaired in the sense of their limitations before. They had low self-esteem, little direction in life. And <clears throat> by the mid-40s, for example, they're almost abreast of uh, the Oakland boys who really went through in this uh, greatest generation period and 91% and went into the war and uh, <clears throat> the GI Bill enhanced their future. Uh, and the point that I, I'm trying to raise here is that um, we tend to put uh, a lot of eggs in one environmental basket at one time, they're living a life and some of those transitions in the future are gonna turn their lives around. This was not a sequence of depression and war that in any way could be thought of as planned at all, but it worked that way. And it, it points to the fact that we really don't know 
when the ball game is over until it's over, really. And I think that we, we take children and take the, <clears throat> the Berkeley kids who um, really had a bad, bad time, the boys uh, in the depression years, and uh, they um, uh, had a sense of uh, not going anywhere. And then they hit uh, World War II and they're too young to go into the service World War II, but they were right at the right time to go into this Korean War. And that war, that training, the camaraderie and all of the, the, the uh, structure they received literally turned their lives around. And uh, so, the point I'm making here is that uh, we, in children of the Great Depression, I focus on one period in, in the 20th century, basically. And uh, I really short strip, short, um, um, uh, cut short the proper analysis of their whole life and the, the subsequent transitions they were going through and uh, their younger uh, uh, cohort was going through. And you need to, we need to, I think, broaden our, our perspective across time to reach a point where we're saying, well, we really don't know uh, what the answer is going to be because they could clearly turn their lives around. And we know that uh, in clinical training and all kinds of experiences, even residential change can literally turn the life of a boy or girl around. And um, so I, I raise this because it, uh, when I finished Children of the Great Depression, I thought, well, I really uh, done the study I needed to do, but I only got halfway there and I realized that um, the experience of the Oakland kids, uh, <clears throat> their experience in relation to where they were in their life and the cha cha challenges they were faced with, they were old enough to carry their weight during the Great Depression. And then they went into the Second World War and uh, hit the GI Bill, which gave them an education uh, it really enriched their lives in, in many, many, many ways. And uh, the same thing for the younger boys, they had a very difficult time, both in the depression years and the war years. They were too young to go into the service and they had this sense of not being worth it, of not, not being the kind of brother their older brother was, you know? he was old enough to go into the service and make it make a contribution uh and so it was only later uh that they really found themselves and it's quite striking when you line them up together uh and compare them across time uh at one point before i i uh, move from the floor here is um the, the, the results I'm, I'm, I've been able to get in a limited uh, database, really, um, on cohort differences um, have raised some major, major questions in other areas. For example, uh, a colleague of mine in, 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 uh, at Harvard in the sociology department has done major work on crime and criminology. And he is arguing that we need to pay attention to the cohorts that children are in because some are at high risk and some are at low risk. And um, that needs to be taken into account. It never has been. Uh, and so uh, some of the spinoff of what I've been able to do just with the Institute um, uh, data is 
leading to some rethinking of the territory that we've we thought we really understood before. Uh, and I do think uh, <clears throat> by falling into this notion of thinking when a, when a study begins, that is an important fact. That's a cohort. These, these uh, study members represent a cohort that needs to be thought of in that way over time. Uh, and um, so anyway, that, that's, uh, that's uh, some of the uh, spinoffs of uh, being able to work on this wonderful database at uh, Berkeley. It wasn't uh, the kind of um, line of work where you can simply go into an archive and pull it off the shelf and field it. It takes a long time. Working with archival data is not a quick process, but it's enormously rewarding and gave me the depth of understanding that I, I treasure really at this point in my, my life. Uh, I think it's uh, been a great uh, benefit. And I regret that we are now placed, we are now faced with limits about uh, following up study members uh, uh, in the future. And I don't understand and haven't been in a situation where I've had to deal with it, but um, a friend of mine, Carl Alexander, was a former student of mine um, at, uh, at Carolina and then at uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, Carl followed a um, African-American sample in, in a poor area, largely oh, African-American, in a poor area of Baltimore from childhood all the way into their mid thirties. And I asked him, it's the title of the book, it deals with the shadow of the past of childhood. Uh, this kind of disadvantage that accumulates over time and so on. And I asked him why he didn't follow these people up. And he said, because we're faced with constraints on doing so. Uh, and I, I think that that cuts off all those wonderful opportunities I had to follow these members of the Berkeley cohorts or samples across time. And most recently, the 1900 generation all the way um, to the nine to their 90s, basically 80s and 90s. Yes. Oh, it's the let, uh, let me go, Neil. Next, the Neil. Yeah, I met you my good. first day of medical school. You were my health policy professor, and you've been my teacher, mentor, colleague, and dear, dear friend ever since that. Then yeah, for for the last 30 years. And over the years, I've just drawn so much inspiration from your work on life course health development, uh, which has had a profound influence by, on my own work on racial disparities in pregnancy outcomes. Can you explain for our audience the life course health development framework and discuss how it has transformed child health research and policy over the last two decades? Neil, you know, you're, you're muted. Oh. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I'll do that in five minutes. Uh, so um, part of part of what I think we're confronting right now is uh, we're confronting a society that's producing enormous inequalities uh, and enormous inequalities in children's lives and children's outcomes. We also have a society in which the healthcare system doesn't work very well at all. It's the, it's the most inefficient, uh, low-performing healthcare system in the, in, the, in the world, and our children are at the bottom of everything in terms of how it performs. And we're watching a massive shift in the epidemiology of childhood. Part of what I've done over the last many years is looked at trends in children's, and what we've seen is this massive change with 
the syndemics of obesity and mental health disorders, neurodevelopmental and dis- addiction disorders. And they're not because of a new gene, a new germ, or a new chemical. It's because we're changing the ecosystem, the context in which children live, and the mismatches. Are- so life course health development, what we tried to do was look at we just don't have the right operating system for the healthcare system. It's just not working and it's not functioning right. So I began looking at the life course sociology work of Glenn Elder and others that was looking at social context and age and cohort and historical effects on cumulative mechanisms and looking at that. And then the lifespan developmental psychology, which was different. It was looking at individual functioning and development of individual differences and adaptivity, plasticity, and resilience. That starts coming together with the link live studies and these pathway and trajectory studies. But what we did is we held up a health prism to that. And we held it up using chronic disease epidemiology work that was being done by David Barker and others and Len Syme and Tom Boyce and others health economists that were looking over time, like the, the kind of uh, work that Jim Hackman was doing at a macro level, because that was uh, important. And then looking at the developmental origins work that was being done um, by Michael Meany and others to understand how epigenetics and, and also early intervention works were modifying. So if you put all that through a health lens, you start to understand that health is a developmental process and um, that that health emerges out of a complex, multi-dimensional, multi-level developmental ecosystem. And uh, the timing is incredibly important and the harmonization of different time scales are incredibly important. Cultural time scales, social time scales, individual time scales, those all have to be harmonized for health to emerge. And that transduction of these ecosystem influences into changes in biobehavioral regulation can be measured in terms of changes in the HPA axis or how the prefrontal cortex develops or um, how the midbrain functions. And that those things have lifelong uh, impacts on the health development trajectories of, of children. The reason why this becomes important is that we start to understand how lifelong health is front loaded early in life and that how important equity is for in terms we keep talking about health equity, it becomes very difficult to get health equity if you don't get health equity early on. Because one of the, the key aspects of development is one of the functions of development is the process of compounding of differences. And when you have little differences in little people, over time they become big differences in big people. Mm-hmm. So the life course health development makes helps us think about health as a complex system, as a developmental process, and how if we're going to approach these equity issues, we have to think about equity from the start. We have to think about different ways of preventing what's going on and really rethinking many of the things we're confronted with. And so um, when we think about this emergence of all these mental health problems that are happening in adolescence today, why is it happening? What is going on? I think, you know, to uh, Julie's work and Ron's work, I think what we're seeing is a massive change in adolescence that is happening from life, life history of when puberty started at age 15 and people were married at age 18 or 20, there was a period of psychosexual vulnerability of about five years in the life history. This is going back centuries ago. And what's happened now is we have puberty is at 11 years and marriage happens at 25 years. So the period of psychosexual vulnerability in our society has increased massively. And the wrapping around that of culture and family things have been taken off and it's just been colonized by Wall, St- Wall Street and Madison Avenue and the children are being, you know, sort of um, uh, taken advantage of in, in various ways. So a life course in a way of thinking about health development starts to ask about what is going on during these 
developmental periods? How do we understand how health development and how do we understand these larger social contextual factors and how they get embedded into our biology and our behavior? It creates a completely different operating system for the healthcare system because we no longer then think about everything in terms of, you know, biomedical immediate things, but we start thinking a lot more uh, long-term longitudinal about the developmental processes we're trying to influence. Thank you, Neil. Uh, let me go to Ron next. Uh, Ron, you now lead the Institute for Human Development, which is widely regarded as the birthplace of the life force perspective. And your current work focuses on adolescence as a developmental period with unique opportunities for early intervention in relation to a wide range of behavioral and emotional health problems. How has the life force perspective influenced your own work and how has it transformed uh, adolescent health research and policy over the past two decades? Thanks. Um, I think in many ways, what I, what I wanna say builds uh, pretty directly on a few of the things Neil was just commenting on. And that is that it's not that in the Institute or, or in my own work, we think it's mostly about adolescence. It's that of course, early development matters, of course, prenatal and early postnatal and you know, formative learning, so much of you know, setting uh, basic aspects of the formative learning in these systems is set earlier. And I think that, that the vision of the, of the Institute of Human Development now isn't that there's one important period of development, and, and Glenn mentioned this earlier, it's that how do we get insights into the particular vulnerabilities, addressable opportunities in different windows of time. And, and I think one of the reasons a lot of our work has been focusing increasingly on adolescence is that's when a lot of the clinically relevant and public health relevant problems are emerging. But now let me say the most important point I wanna make in this space, and in my own thinking, uh, how it's changed over the past 15 or 20 years, I had been in interdisciplinary teams, you know, with psych psychiatrists, psychologists, and pediatricians, really trying to think about early intervention for behavioral and emotional problems, which were, were starting to go up to high rates. And, and I, I left there to come here to Berkeley and, and be part of the School of Public Health and be part of the Institute of Development, because I, I, I believe that, it's, that focusing on the problems when they get to the level of clinical diagnosis isn't the best strategy. And, and rather than focusing on problems, if we really start focusing on how to promote health and healthy development and healthy mental development, which, is, which isn't mental, it's, it's behavioral development, emotional development, social development. And in that case, I think one of the most exciting frontiers where we're getting insights to multi-level developmental and learning processes is in early adolescence, the transition from childhood into adolescence and promoting that's a sensitive period for learning about self and other and social relationships and emotionally charged relationships in new ways. And puberty, the beginning, the early kindling of puberty that's happening earlier and is individually different is starting a set of learning processes. And the expansion of adolescence creates amplified vulnerability, but it also can create amplified opportunity. There's a long window of time for learning. And if we could provide more equitable support, more equitable learning experiences. One of the things young people start caring more about as they move into adolescence is about mattering, about contributing, creating more equitable opportunities for young people to contribute in meaningful ways. The stories Glenn was mentioning about what gave meaning and purpose to people's lives, what made them feel like they mattered for the culture they were in at that time were powerfully influential and changing trajectories. Mm -hmm. We need to understand the complexity of those issues for young people today, help them contribute, help them to develop in pro-social ways, mattering by doing things that matter. And so I think it's, it's, it's giving us insights, not that early adolescence is the most important time or toddlerhood or school entry, it is what are the policies and practices that can optimize these positive experiences for a larger number of young people, and including the most disadvantaged or the, having the least access to these opportunities, those are the powerful areas of progress, I think, that are happening. And the Institute of Human Development is trying to bring together different disciplines to think about these complex real world issues with these scientific insights, but really try to apply them in these pragmatic ways. Mm -hmm. Th thank you, Ron. And, and I'll hold that thought okay, for, for now because I, I do want to make sure we do a deeper dive into what can, must we do differently uh, in research, in practice, in policy 
uh, from a life course perspective. But before we go there, uh, let me turn to Julie. And as a clinical psychologist, can you explain to our audience how stress impacts on health and development across the life course? Wow, that's a big charge. Um, I can I can talk a little bit about the work that I do um, and some of the, the things we've been seeing in my research. Um, so most recently, um, I've worked in a longitudinal study, a 20-year study in uh, the Salinas Valley, Valley, which is largely an agricultural area. Um, and the cohort that we have, we followed over 600 uh, mother-child dyads um, for over 20 years now. So the moms were recruited when they were pregnant um, and now the kids are young adults in this sample. Majority farm worker families um, are living in and around agricultural fields. So the, the study was started to look at the effects of chemical exposures, but of course, these families live in contexts where they're facing quite a bit of adversity. And as a psychologist who came onto this study, we're very interested in how some of the, the, those um, early adverse events got under the skin, to your point, Michael, um, to potentially create stress processes um, that could, you know, be detrimental, not deterministic, but detrimental um, over the life course. And so we've done some work looking at early adversity, both in utero, um, when moms were pregnant, so mom's adversity, and also um, life events that kids were exposed to. And we found, uh, to Neil's point, that there is dysregulation of stress response based on, you know, level of poverty and level of other um, traumatic experiences that youth, um, youth are faced with, even in their very early years. And we've seen um, neuroendocrinological uh, systems that are responsive to stress change as early as age five. Um, the good news, and this kind of follows the, the work of Jay Belsky, who is a preeminent developmental psychologist who studies uh, life course and life history theory, is that um, families do act as the psychological nutrients. And so we have shown that even in five-year-olds who are exposed to extreme poverty, if mom can be present, warm, and responsive, um, and also that cultural values around familism, um, can be protective against some of these effects. And so um, they can basically wipe out the negative effects of some of the, the adversity exposure. So that's from the individual level. But once you start thinking about that, uh, you start thinking about, well, how can families be present? How can they be responsive? Many of our family members, the moms when uh, their children were younger were working in the fields and were away from the home and there were alternative caregivers or siblings were acting as caregivers at times. Um, and so that community is important but also there are things that are, that are policy oriented, that are structurally oriented, like uh, paid leave, um, time off um, when, when women give birth, um, the importance of being home with family when you need to be, working shifts that are, are responsible, getting paid a living wage, um, having access to food and access to healthcare. These kinds of things really affect structurally and contextually the psychological environment that youth and families are growing up in. And more recently, we've been doing some work on fear of deportation and immigration policy and how that's affecting the youth in our sample now that they're older. And they were all born in the United States. I, I, I wanna um, underscore that these are youth that are citizens of the United States, but the fear and worry that they have about their parents and family members shows in their blood pressure, in mm -hmm. their, um, their sleep disturbances, in um, depression and anxiety measures. And so these are things we really have to think about because they come not from their individual level experience necessarily, but from the, the policies, the rhetoric, um, and the structures that aren't protecting and supporting them. So to Ron's point, there are so many things that we need to do in the larger contextual environment to support our youth and young adults. Um, so that they can they can have healthy outcomes and they can and live their best lives. And right now, the inequities that everybody's talked about are are preventing that um, for many people in the United States. We have a responsibility. It's why I ended up in public health and didn't stay in psychology. We have a larger responsibility to these structures. Thank you, Julie. And uh, yeah, let's go ahead and turn our attention to uh, uh, to. to
to what, what must we do different uh, in a uh, kind of life course uh, in the last 50 years. We learned a lot, we've done a lot, but I think all of you will agree that we still have a long way to go uh, to improve health for all in this country and around the globe. So, so let's start with research. Uh, and, and let me just kind of throw this question out to all of you. Uh, what are the remaining knowledge gaps about the life course theory and how might we design future research, especially intervention studies to improve health and advance health equity from a life course perspective? And maybe we can start with Neil. Uh, sure. Uh, as, as you know, Michael, uh, we have a life course intervention uh, research network funded by the Maternal and Child Health Bureau that includes now about 70 scientists from around the country, all working in different nodes. We have a family node, a school node, um, uh, a early childhood mental health node. And so, and uh, we're, we're struggling exactly with those kinds of issues um, and trying to figure out best how to move the, the field forward and build the field. And part of that is really thinking about new methodologies to use. Actually, one of our nodes is a YPAR node that's being led by uh, Emily Ozer uh, there at UC Berkeley, who is a kind of national treasure when it comes to YPAR re research. And she's pulled together all these young researchers to think about how do we involve youth actually in the research and in the creation of the interventions in ways that uh, respond to what Ron is talking about to make it sort of both uh, meaningful and transformative uh, for them. The, the area that I think is uh, really important is really thinking about multi-level interventions that focus both on families and on communities. Uh, I remember, Michael, you and I had a conversation a couple of years ago about changing the name of the Maternal and Child Health Bureau to the, child and fa to the Family and Child Bureau, because I think what's going on in our country and part of the ecosystem change that is, a, is really affecting families, that families are squeezed for time, resources, uh, and services and everything else. And uh, we don't really understand well about how to work with families and intervene with families. But our country in relationship to most of the OECD countries, all of them have for early childhood, comprehensive early childhood education systems, health systems, and family support systems. We don't do family support in the United States because we have a whole set of ideological barriers to it. So the Life Course Intervention Research Network, we have a family node now that's working on developing a new set of measures about family health development. So how do families develop a sort of a new families ages and stages so that we can measure that? But I think it's really the multi-level life course interventions that are done both within um, looking at communities, looking at, and, and looking at, uh, at families. You're seeing a lot of this now. There's two major intervention cohorts going on right now in the world that have just been launched. One is the Born in Bradford study that's being done in Bradford, England. Uh, 13,000 kids um, that are being provided all these services to sort of see how do they optimize development there's Gen V that's now going on in, in Victoria, uh, Australia, a similar intervention cohorts. And I think we need to be moving towards intervention cohorts, not just cohorts where we're measuring what happens, but actually how do we intervene and, and optimize the healthy development, all of what Ron is saying. How do we really optimize well-being and learn how to do it in the best possible way? That has not been the orientation of NIH and our research funding in, the, in this country, and we need to be shifting towards that. Mm. Th thank you, Neil. And, and the why part work that you referred to that Emily Ozer is leading uh, stands for Youth uh, Participatory Action Research and really follows a legacy uh, that's born out of Berkeley Public Health uh, of community uh, kind of based participatory research, uh, the idea that when we do research in the community, that we do it with the community and not on the community. Uh, Julie, 
Uh, anything else that you want to add to what Neil just said about research? Yeah, you know, I, I um, echo everything that Neil said and also that Ron said, um, so I won't repeat it, but a space that I think is really important and interesting right now um, is the idea of accelerated aging or weathering. And um, again, I really think of that from upstream perspective. So Arlene Geronimus um, is known for a theory around weathering where daily stressors and hassles and discriminatory experiences can get under the skin, specifically for black and brown women um, to create stressful processes and over time lead to certain outcomes that, that approximate aging um, early in the life course. And so I think of that through my lens of puberty and why do we see certain groups, um, in particular black and brown girls, going through puberty earlier um, than their white and Asian counterparts. There's some really interesting work right now that we're on the threshold of looking at epigenetics and aging. And so um, I think that this is gonna be revolutionary to an extent because there's been such a history of blaming the victim for poor health outcomes. And uh, as we start to really pay attention to structural issues like um, exclusionary policies, historical redlining, um, lack of access to care in certain communities and individual discrimination, but also structural discrimination. We can start thinking about how do these cumulative, to Glenn's point, these cumulative experiences over time wear people down mm -hmm. and start to wear them down both physiologically and in her terms of health outcomes. So we have some work right now that's looking at um, early cognitive aging in the sample I was describing before among the mothers who are quite young still in their 40s and late 40s. And might they be experiencing early cognitive decline from their exposures? Um, we've also um, been looking at how those processes in utero can potentially lead to early aging in, um, in youth and kids. And these are processes that I think we have to move really far upstream to put a stop to and transform in order to get ahead of these problems, both intergenerationally and across the life course. Thank you, Julie. Let me go to Ron next. Ron, uh, just knowledge gaps and future direction for research? Yeah, I think a couple points I want to highlight that I think build on all the things that have been said before. I, I think one is that we we need to do some bold integration of what we under what we're currently understanding and use that. And I'm gonna, I want to put air quotes around the idea of an experiment. I think we the multi level interactions in development where you're really taking seriously the role of community and social influences and emotional influences. And, and individual differences and timing and, and harmonizing as Neil was referring to. If, if we try to measure multiple levels and do a multi-level intervention and we're following cohorts for a long period of time and the world is rapidly changing, it, it's gonna be really hard to get uh, deep, meaningful insights that are gonna inform the kind of action we, we want it to inform policy, to inform practice. So I think what we need is to do some bold experiments. And the only kind of experiments that are gonna be morally and, and, and ethically the right ones to do is com compare two different best shots to making things better mm -hmm. and to use really strong theory and science to say, here's a window of opportunity for development. Here are two strong theories about how to help develop not just you know, physical health, but you know, thriving and, and social development. And let's compare them and, and design it with really the kinds of teams Neil's talking about. You need expertise across a lot of levels, but do it in a way that we're learning rapidly from what we're trying to do. It's, it's trying to push in a positive direction at a time we think is opportune. And we, we almost need to do that as an experiment, and, and, but, but design it in a way with youth involved and the communities engaged that it really informs back in, in meaningful ways. And then the last thing I would say, which maybe is controversial to, to some people is, I think there has been an unbelievable amount of progress in understanding the basic science of, of underpinning different aspects of, of developmental learning processes. And rather than think that that implies something deterministic, it, it's leading to insights about the role of context, about the role of learning, about the, the role of social relationships. That's what the brain is designed to do as it's developing is to learn about 
about other people and how, how to connect and contribute. And so to leverage some of this amazing science that's giving us hints about some of these opportunities, not to, to polarize what's social and what's clinical uh, and, 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 and some of the basic science. And that requires teams of people that really trust each other and, and, and are, are reaching across the, the typical silos. And, and so I think that there are opportunities to do some really innovative intervention level experiments that are going to give us meaningful answers about where we're getting traction, where it's helping and who it's helping. And there's some, there's some great examples. There's some, some amazing teams out there doing this kind of work. Um, and, and then finally, rather than look at one outcome, are we improving public health? Are we improving educational outcomes? Are we improving social outcomes? Are we improving economic outcomes? I think increasingly what we're understanding is that these are intertwined. And so investing in improving uh, development and thriving isn't just, public health is, is, is the most powerful framework and it's, it's much broader than just health, even, even health in the, in the broadest sense. So it's, it's an exciting time to be taking the best science. Um, uh, and, and the final part I want to highlight that is both a challenge and an opportunity is that increasingly, particularly for children and adolescents, the social context where this learning is occurring is through screens and digital technology. And that is amplifying both vulnerabilities and opportunities. And things are changing so fast that looking backward or looking longi longitudinally at studies that were started five or seven years ago, the learning context for so many of the young people is changing so quickly that if we don't design our interventions for young people developing in a rapidly changing world and what helps them adapt in positive ways to a rapidly changing world, then we will have less impact in our insights from those studies. Thank you, Ron. Glenn, you, got, you started all of this. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to give you the last word on research. Where, where should life course research go next? Well, I just want to thank uh, everyone for this uh, seminar. Uh, it was, to me, it was very valuable because I've been in an interdisciplinary world all my life, really, but um, uh, not recently so much. And uh, it's been good to get this uh, update on what is happening, especially in intervention. This is not a, a, a field that uh, I keep abreast of as much as I, sh I should. I uh, I think that um, what I would like to see in the in the in the years ahead is uh, um, much more um, thought uh, devoted to uh, how we are going to field studies and collect data on on cohorts, uh, samples over time, and um, uh, preserve this, the, these data, and for, for uh, generations of scientists to work with. Uh, I worry a lot about what we're doing and not doing with our archives. Uh, this is something that I see because I've, I've really, benefited from them over many, many years. And uh, uh, I think that um, we're so busy producing our work that and, uh, we don't get to the point of thinking about how are we going to preserve these records on people over the years? Uh, how can that be done? And uh, I think it's the only way it's going to happen is uh, if uh, collectively we form a group uh, that will oversee this because there needs to be someone thinking about this, I think. And there may be, uh, but I see so much of the other, the loss of records, the loss of data and, um, and um, the failure to be able to carry forward a body of data, a, a cohort, for example, 
that's just about to really yield major insights into processes in people's lives and in, in society. So that would be my takeaway at the end that uh, we need to care about uh, not only the people we're working with and uh, the society we live in, but we also need to care about the records that we depend on uh, over time. And, and the Berkeley um, Institute was an amazing uh, institution for many, many years. And uh, it's a fragile institution and it's not there as it was, you know, and it's changed. So, uh, and I'm just grateful that I was able to preserve those records and work with them and follow this 1900 generation uh, across the years because I don't know of another data source that would enable me to do that at this point. And uh, that's sad. I, I think we need to be concerned about that. So that, that, thank you, Glenn. Yes. Uh, I have kind of one more question for you all, but, but before I do that, I'm just going to ask uh, the, the audience that, that if you have questions for our panel, uh, please go ahead and type in the live chat and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. So, so before we can open up for audience question, I just want to talk a bit kind of, kind of more about practice systems and policy policy changes that are needed to improve population health and advance health equity from a life course perspective. What must our nation's healthcare system, our public health system, and our policy makers do differently? Uh, and maybe we can start with you, Ron. So I think the, the simple thing I would introduce, even though it raises complex uh, application issues, is help these institutions that are serving young people um, in practice and, in, and at a policy level be thinking about trajectories. How do we not just deal with the immediate problem about a young person in, in school or, or uh, with, with a system or, and, and think about how we're influencing the trajectory? And I think that bringing that mindset into uh, practice, there's such a urgently dealing with problems that are most salient in that moment uh, and dealing with it. To, to, uh, and that's often uh, wasting a lot of resources uh, because um, if we really have a system that thinks about promoting development and, and learning and, and thriving, um, it, 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 it brings a different way of evaluating and, and the metrics that we, we use. Um, and it's, it's more like investing. It's more like thinking about how to promote um, you know, health or, or deal with the problem. And obviously that's very different for an education system or a healthcare health, health delivery system. But I think broadly, it's, it's incorporating more of that mindset um, in, in ways that recognize there are unique opportunities and challenges for young people at different stages of their lives and their, and where they, and their families and supports, uh, and really trying to bring that kind of a perspective um, and, 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 and doing that in practical ways, having people with expertise in that space help to, to change how the interface is uh, better incorporating that perspective and value system. Great, thank, thank you, Ron. Julie, uh, anything you wanna add? Sure, I would, I would just say that I think we need to make a bold commitment as a nation to um, deconstructing some of the historically racist systems that exclude people from growing up in healthy environments um, and exclude them from having the advantages, which should be uh, human rights to um, be able to live in neighborhoods that are safe, go to schools that are top notch and um, to have access to healthcare that's, that's premium. We're in uh, one of the wealthiest countries in the world, if not the wealthiest country, and and um, so it's a it's it has to be bold, it has to be broad, and it has to be targeted in order to reduce the inequities that we see. When I, I, I think I've said probably enough. <laughs> I've monopolized too much. <laughs> okay, well let, I, let me go to kind of Neil then. Neil. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what must our nation do differently to address 
uh, to, to improve population health and tackle health inequities uh, from a life course perspective? Well, one using a life course perspective, Venetia could come up with a national outcomes framework for children that would, could be used as a framework that many other countries do so that we have outcomes that we're trying to achieve and then we specify them. We have this thing called healthy people with gazillions of, of things. We need a nice, simple outcomes framework that says this is what we want to achieve for two-year-olds, six-year-olds, eight-year-olds, and, and set that as a standard. Second is we need data systems. We've been talking for 25 years about the importance of neurodevelopment in the first five years or eight years of life. Children in America are completely invisible between ages from birth to age eight. We only have data from birth outcomes that's owned by the healthcare system. And for third grade reading, between zero and eight kids are invisible. We need to turn on the lights so that we can actually see the trajectories and see the inequalities. They're doing that in Canada, they do it in Australia, they do it in most other countries. We've been trying to do it in California. We have something called First Five in California that's been going on, spent $20 billion. We have no data systems in place to measure what we've been doing, mm -hmm. and it's a shame. The third thing we need to do, besides accountability for outcomes and data, we need to be thinking about our finance systems in various different ways of how do you actually invest in life course trajectory. We have it completely asked backwards in terms of our healthcare system because our healthcare system waits till the trajectories go into the toilet, so to speak, and that people are horribly off and then we spend all our money there and then we have a health policy about about shifting the cost curve as if you could shift the money once people are already so sick. We need to shift the health curve, which means shifting the trajectories early on in life. And that means investing very differently in, uh, in our country. Um, and when we look at the countries that are doing much better, they're spending much more early on on kids and families and on social services. So they're investing in the success of their population. We're paying for failure. And yeah. that's a, a, a life course failure. So yeah. those are three things. And then we have to innovate our way forward. I would really want to come in what Ron said about kind of multi-solving strategies that we need to use because we have to solve lots of problems at the same time. And the, and the main problem is our world's changing too fast for us to adapt to. So we're, we've got contexts that are rapidly changing and we have to sort of get a handle on it. That means that we have to really experiment and innovate. And we're trying to do something now in California called All Children Thrive California, which is trying to turn cities into micro enterprises, of social innovation for children with youth councils and youth leading the way on that. We have 18 cities that are in the pilot of that and which just got reauthorized by the legislature to take it to 40 more cities. I feel like we're laying track for people like Julie and Ron and others to come in and do the experiments in these cities so that we can actually test some of these ideas. But we need to innovate our way forward and not just think we're going to keep patching or make little improvements. We need major transformation at this point. But I think, with, you know, with better accountability, better data, uh, a different kind of investment strategy, and a a way of discovering our way forward, we can actually make great headway. Great, th thank you, Neil. Uh, let's open it up for audience questions. And let me go to Elise. Uh, Elise, do we have any questions in the live chat? Yeah, we have a few. Um, first, I someone has asked, can you speak to Dr. Nadine Burke Harris's work with adverse childhood experiences and the role of nurturing in the treatment for early traumas. And can you speak of this uh, work in California and the role of Berkeley Public Health, our school in these efforts? So um, maybe that would be for Juliana, Ron, and Michael. Julia, Ron. I mean, I would actually, yeah, I would actually kick it to you, Michael. I mean, you've been in such close contact with, um, Dr. Burke Harris, that you, you, I, although I know pieces and parts, I know it's also very difficult to both measure ACEs in the variety of settings that uh, her goals are in the state of California, and then also to address the, that adversity 
um, once it's discovered if you're not in a strong wraparound setting. So maybe you could speak to that. Yeah, I'm actually going to put it over to Neil because I, you know, I think uh, Neil uh, really has a lot of insight into the impact of early trauma uh, and what the state and what the nation ought to be doing about that. Well, I think uh, Nadine has done just a, a, a tremendous service in terms of elevating the, the importance of early trauma in children's lives and the levels of adversity. I think adversity isn't limited to the things on the scale. There's a, you know, uh, an ecosystem of adversity that's kind of different in different places and sort of understanding that's important if we're going to actually move upstream and change it. I think the screening is potentially really important, but only if we can have ways of responding to it. And, you know, when I was running the Center for the Vulnerable Child, we had all these kids coming in. We screened, we didn't call it ACEs then, it was for psychosocial trauma. Uh, but we had a whole team of social workers and developmental uh, home visitors and, and things. And the problem now is that we don't have the wraparound services that are necessary, nor do we have the healthcare systems that design. When pediatricians see kids and they come get all the different uh, adversities and they identify all the different family problems, they send them out in the world into 18 different directions and pray that they're going to get the services. Mm. In other countries, what they do is they have family resource centers that bring all that stuff together in one place. So it's not all random. And, and there are models of that, Michael. You know, the Hope Street Family Center in Los Angeles, which does that. And there are other models throughout California and but we need to really rethink about how the system has to be changed to be able to be really responsive to these levels of trauma and not just screen for them, but actually be responsive to them. And not just in a clinical way, I think we really want to think about how do we do this more systemically, you know, not kid by kid, uh, one at a time, because then what we're doing is we're screening and just trying to bring up the tail of the curve of those that are vulnerable. And as more and more kids are vulnerable, you just can't keep bringing up the tail of the curve. You have to move from a marginal risk strategy that's bringing up the tail to a median risk strategy that's trying to shift the whole curve forward. And the life course approach helps you think about how do we shift the whole trajectory curve? And that should be part of the design of, as we're approaching ACEs in a, in a population way. And if I could add to that, Michael, I would just say adolescents are really, um vulnerable in this in this space because uh, people are scared to ask them if they are suicidal or if they're experiencing trauma. And uh, once you know that, to Neil's point, there's often nowhere to refer them to. And uh, Charlie Irwin at UCSF will say, um, it's hard to ask because you don't get to bill to, to manage it in the room even. And so our system's not set up for that kind of holding and care. Uh, it gets even worse as they transition into young adulthood, particularly if they're not in a college setting where there's services available. Uh, and so um, I'm, a, I'm a huge advocate for school-based health centers as a, as a space that kids can go to receive safe and confidential services. Um, unfortunately, good, strong, well-resourced school-based health centers are, um, are really hard to find. I and mean, we have a good one at uh, Berkeley High, right down the street from, from campus. Um, they struggle all the time to make sure that their mental health services are available for to meet the need, and even more so after COVID. Mm. Uh, and I'll just add that that you know, I, I agree with Neil. I, I don't think we're going to be able to like screen and and treat our uh, kind of way out of this problem, especially in communities that have been disproportionately uh, kind of impacted by by early trauma. Uh, okay, in, in Black, Indigenous uh, communities of color, uh, where I, I think, okay, really the root cause of the problem uh, is in the institutionalized racism uh, that's manifest not only in differential access to, to healthcare, but, but in, a, in education, in jobs. Uh, and until we start to addressing these socioeconomic and structural and political determinants 
of, uh, of health and health disparities. Now, I, I don't think just simply screening and treating okay, early okay, uh, uh, trauma uh, is going to really help achieve health equity in our nation. Elise, other questions? Um, yeah, actually, Julie mentioned, you know, that the, um, the health center at Berkeley High struggling, you know, after COVID. And I, uh, I was just wondering if you or any of the panelists can just talk about how COVID's affecting the ability of this generation of children and teens to thrive. Um, I mean, it's just like yet another um, thing that, that they're having to deal with along with the digital world and, the, you know, how um, puberty is rushing forward. So I was just wondering if anyone can comment on that. Well, I think the, the first place is that it's a huge complicated um, set of problems and challenges. Um, and in part, it's not only the negative experiences and the trauma and the loss uh, um, and loss of school, but it's also, um, it has interfered with the relationships for young people at a key time when they're trying to learn about relationships. And so it has been a challenge. I think there's two sets of messages from the data I've been seeing from colleagues who've been really looking at this and, and trying to quantify it. I think the first one that's really important is there's a tremendous amount of resilience and, and the resilience sits where you think. It's when there are a more resources and there are families and, and neighborhoods that really have helped young people um, you know, to, to be resilient. And, and um, technology has been both a positive way for them to interact and connect and contribute and do creative things. And it's also been a vulnerability for young people to find negative patterns of behavior uh, that, that, that get amplified. And again, the inequities, it is, it's, it's amplifying inequities. And so I think those are, are, are really large issues. I think there's another big picture issue here, and we, we haven't talked much about global uh, uh, as uh, perspectives, but I, I think there's a lot of concern, not just with mental health challenges among adolescents and the increase in mental health challenges with all of the changes in society as well as COVID, but the, the stakes are really high. We, we have the largest number of young people in the world who will be coming of age in the next 15 years. And they are our future leaders. They are the future of work. They are the parents uh, and caretakers and teachers of the next generation of infants that are gonna be born. And, and they're going to be uh, influential in solving the complex issues of climate change and, 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 and the other uh, big scale challenges. And so finding ways to invest to tip the balance in positive ways for young people, for the, this, this generation of this cohort, to, go, to use Glenn's uh, 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 um, terminology, this cohort of young people who are coming of age, 90% of them in low and middle income countries in the world, this, this, this is a huge, um, uh, talk about investment in something positive, helping to promote positive development and success, not only for this huge number of young people who are coming of age in a rapidly changing world, but helping them contribute in valuable ways to these challenges. So there's, there's many, many different ways we can ha have a positive impact, but I think that these issues, and it's not just about diagnosing and treating mental health, it's about how to promote positive experiences during these formative times in these young people's lives. So I think the, the issues of um, being innovative and trying to be change makers and arc benders they are going to be the arc benders that matter most. And so we should be bending the arc to, to really do as much as we can to invest, not just in you know, the population that needs healthcare because they're late in the lifespan as, as Neil is talking about where most of the resources go, but really trying to promote healthy development uh, and, 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 and adaptive uh, learning in young people that really are gonna be the future of our world in many ways. Yeah, Michael, yeah, I just want to respond to that because I completely agree with what Ron is, is, is saying. Uh, I'm also recognizing that I need to talk to Ron a lot more than I have been, you know, so, uh, uh, but uh, so one of the things I want to point out, and this is a toss back to Michael, uh, Michael sent us on a journey several years ago with this idea of developing a new measure of human progress that we've been working on called the Gross de uh, Developmental Potential, GDP2. And part of what we're, we're, what that measure is trying to do or framework is 
and say, how as a society do we start measuring the development of the potential that Ron is talking about? What are the capabilities that people need to be successful? Um, what are the what are the lifelong learning capabilities, the social connection capabilities, the social uh, 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 relational capabilities that need to happen? We could be measuring those, and those could be measures in every community, so that every community was oriented toward maximizing the and optimizing GDP too, the developmental potential of our nation and the developmental potential of the world. So. I think that that turn needs to happen. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like we're heading the opposite direction right now. Uh, but so marshalling those resources and whatever the Berkeley School of Public Health can do to, to move us all in that direction, I, you know, we're looking towards you, Michael. <laughs> well, I, and I would say that our students are among our best art vendors. I mean, our students come from first generation families. They have lived experiences um, and they've had resilience and fortitude and, and cheerleaders that have gotten them to UC Berkeley, to UCLA, to UNC, to, to institutions where they, they're here in our master's of public health or our undergraduate public health major because they have big ideas and they wanna fight and to Ron's point, they know what it's like to be growing up right now during these times and what the last 10 years were like for them. Um, and, and I truly, you know, often, Michael, it feels like a punt and I hear you do this too, but they're our future. <laughs> they're uh, they're going to move far beyond we are where we are. And so all the investments that we can make and the community can, community can make and the resources we can pour into our students is going to pay off dividends later. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I want to make sure you, you all have an opportunity to give your final thoughts. So, so uh, let, let's just kind of take one more question, Elise. Sure. Um, we have a question. Um, how do you see the life course approach applied in prevention of chronic disease, such as kidney disease and heart disease for adults throughout the lifespan? Don't you all like just jump in? I know each one of you could probably give a whole lecture on this. <laughs> so so I, I, who's going to take one uh, for, for the team here? I, I, I feel like I've said so much already, but I think that there is, you know, what our life course health development model does is starts to think about what are the sensitive periods uh, early on where these trajectories, whether uh, the, the regulatory processes that are uh, uh, metabolic or uh, neuroendocrine uh, inflammatory, those are all things that are mutable and changeable and understanding what those inflection points are, where they happen and how do you support them. And I agree with uh, Ron that more and more of our our focus should go on to focus on how do we optimize trajectories at, at points and, and really marshal our, our, our attention to those points. There are certain transitions and turning points where there's hypersensitivity to those, those kinds of interventions and we should spend a whole lot more time on that. But part of that also means collecting data in a different way and, and, um, and understanding that we have to under, you know, we do a lot of our statistics or ergodic statistics where we're comparing people to a to other people, but we also need to do ideographic measures so that we actually understand the variation in individuals over time. And we do preciously little of that. But I think there's just enormous opportunity to take advantage of this new science to optimize healthy development uh, and to prevent many of the chronic illnesses that we see. Well, th thanks, Neil. Uh, let me kind of give all of you uh, 30 seconds uh, each uh, to give uh, one final thought, one takeaway message, one call to action that you want our audience to leave this session with. And let's start with Julie. I would say if we're gonna be change makers and arc vendors, then we need to involve the communities um, that we are working with in our research. So I wanna elevate and underscore Neil's work and Ron's comments about involving youth and involving families. 
um, side by side, hand in hand, uh, bringing the skills that we have to the table and working equitably toward a more positive and healthy future. Wrong. Uh, I guess I would focus on two uh, the two issue, sets of issues that uh, have come up. I think one is work in interdisciplinary teams and in bold interdisciplinary teams because these are complex issues. Uh, and if we're going to really take actionable insights from life course and, and implement them, we, we need these teams. And the second is focus on the positive opportunities. I think we, we, we're we drawn to try to decrease the, the problems and decrease the traumas. I, thinking about how we can improve the positive aspects of, of this, the, the mirror image of these processes will probably lead us closer to impact, especially in a rapidly changing world. So shifting away from problem focused to improvement, uh, pr improving these trajectories and, and doing that in really transformative ways. Glenn? I was just thinking of uh, <clears throat> uh, in a world where uh, I see an awful lot of athletics uh, and uh, in adjacent communities as well as uh, at the university level. Uh, I just see an awful lot of uh, positive input here and turnaround in lives and uh, was wondering uh, what what we see, what what is um, ongoing in communities uh, that really capture that uh, uh, energy and, and enthusiasm and support uh, from families and everything. So it's, uh, that's something that comes, um, comes across rather uh, positively in the whole Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill region. And I was wondering uh, what the pos pos prospects might be of really doing more than we are now in, in mobilizing young people through athletics uh, in, in a positive way it, toward uh, accomplishment in, in um, academics as well as uh, in life generally, so. Thank you, Glenn. Yeah. Uh, Neil, I'm gonna give you the last word. <clears throat> well, I, I'm gonna call for a life course health development revolution. I think that what we really need to do is pull the innovators that are working in the space together and, and do a critical mass to sort of work on real transformation in this space and not nibble around the edges, but really be bold in the way that Ron is encouraging and Juliana is as well. And use new design and innovation approaches to doing that. Embrace the complexity, not run away from it and try to minimize it. And and, and really use all of our imaginative ways that we can to sort of move this forward. It's, it's, it's the, this is a, we're in an existential crisis and these are the existential solving tools that we need. We have them, we just have to apply them now and make the, make, make the world better by doing it. Make it and make the lives of all these kids a whole lot better. It's just, it's painful to watch you know, and see what's going on when we know we can be doing much better, but it really means being much bolder and, uh, and transformative in what we're doing. And, you know, and I, if anybody place can do it, Berkeley's the place. So. <laughs> okay, well, well uh, thank you, Neil. And with that call for a life course revolution, <laughs> in Berkeley. we're gonna go ahead and close today's <laughs> event by thanking all of our panelists Thank you for an amazing conversation. Thank you for your life's work on the life course perspective. And, and thank you for fighting the good fight for health equity, for social justice. And let me also thank our audience for joining us this evening. Uh, we will be taking a break over the summer months and please come back in the fall where I will be talking with more innovators, change makers and art vendors of public health. So thanks everybody and be well. Thank you. Thank you.